Hi, and welcome back. Now that we have a good understanding of non-parametric measures of association and understanding how to test hypotheses using the chi-square statistic, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about independent variables that are dichotomous and dependent variables measured at the ratio and ordinal level. We're going to talk about the t-test. First, we're going to describe what is a t-test and when to use a t-test. We're going to look at the t-test formula specifically and how it's calculated. Then we're going to walk through the entire calculation for the t-statistic using an example problem and we'll summarize everything that we've done as we always do. Okay, so let's start by looking at our research hypothesis classification template and we've learned a variety of things with the chi-square statistic and our measures of association with tau b and with gamma and Kramer's v and phi. The t-test deals with one specific box within our classification template where our independent variable is dichotomous and our dependent variable is at the interval or ratio level. And it's because our dependent variable is measured at the interval slash ratio level of measurement, if we think to univariate statistics, we think some of the best statistics that we can generate for an interval or ratio level measurement include things like means. And as we break a dependent variable at the interval ratio level into subgroupings, we can now compare means. So the t-test is a comparison of means and it determines whether the differences in means across these two subgroups are in fact statistically significant. Remember, when we break things into groups of two, we're creating dichotomies and anything can be turned into a dichotomy. There are naturally occurring dichotomies, of course, for example, male-female. But many dichotomies are artifact dichotomies, things that we create. We decide that we establish an experimental condition and we define a success for our experiment. So let's say we define a success condition as being an observation that was observed in a southern state versus observations not being observed in a southern state. We impose this regional dichotomy, southern versus non-southern. Or you can do the same thing with party identification. You can say our success condition is defined as every observation who's self-identified as being a Democrat. And our fail condition is all those observations who've not self-identified as being a Democrat be they Republicans, Independents, or whatever. There's different types of t-tests. We're going to look specifically today at what's called an independent samples t-test, equal variances assumed. The equal variances refers to the variances within the subsamples, and we're assuming that they're equal provided they, that one of the variances is not at least twice as large as the other. And the difference between an independent samples t-test and a paired t-test is the idea that an independent sample is a population that's been broken up into two subpopulations and we're comparing those two subpopulations through sampling and then as we break that sample into two subgroups we would get two sample means for the subgroups. A paired sample t-test is where you have a single observation measured at two different points. So for example let's say that there are participants in a drug trial who have their blood pressure measured at time one, and then they take a blood pressure medication, and you measure their blood pressure again at a time somewhere after the, the medication has taken an effect. And you're asking yourself, is the average blood pressure greater at time two or at time one? So the independent samples t-test is just breaking it into subpopulations and making our estimates from subsamples to subpopulations. And a paired sample is the same observations being measured at multiple times. When to use a t-test, we want to conceptualize our variables are drawn from one population and from one sample. We have our dependent variable, again, measured at the interval or ratio level, and our independent variable that's a dichotomy that we now conceptualize as being two different subsamples. So imagine, as you look at these curves that I have here, that the black line indicates a single sample and the categories of the independent variable, the two categories, are then broken apart. And if, let's say hypothetically, that we're trying to compare average salaries, all right, and we break our, our sample into two subsamples, one for men and one for women, and we're asking 
is there differences in average sa in average salaries? Well, we can imagine a distribution of salaries for our entire sample, the black line, and we can imagine separate subsamples having different averages and different distributions. So say, hypothetically, the blues are the men, the reds are the women, and you're asking yourself, are the average salaries different? Now, what's going on here is, of course, we can observe that there's a mathematical difference between the two salaries, but we have to factor in when we estimate and make a claim whether those differences are statistically significant, whether or not the variances are also going to validate it. Because if they're not sufficiently different from one another, if there's a lot of overlap between the two distributions, then we might not be able to make a claim that that difference is statistically significant. So you can imagine the T formula here, which is looking at the average difference between the two salaries, and it's being divided by the standard error of the difference, which factors in the variance for each of our two subsamples. We understand that there's a difference in the salaries of men and women, but what we don't understand is why some women have higher salaries and lower salaries, why some men have higher salaries and lower salaries. So you can think of the numerator here as being the explained variance and the denominator as being unexplained variance. That's a very important concept because we're going to use this structure as we look at in the next few lectures, we look at interval by interval relationships with R squared and regression, and as we look at nominal and ordinal by interval ratio, and when we look at ANOVA, we're always going to be looking at explained variance in the numerator and unexplained variance in the denominator. So our t-statistic is calculated simply by dividing the distance between the two subsample means by the standard error of the difference between those means. Thought of another way, it's the explained variance to unexplained variance ratio. Or some people might think of it as signal to noise, right? The signal being the distance between the two means and the noise being the unexplained variation that occurs within each of the subsamples. Now we look at the numerator, it's relatively straightforward. It's, it's simply the, the distance between the two submeans. But the denominator looks like it's complicated. The standard error of the difference in means has this very apparently complicated formula, but on further inspection you'll realize that it's actually not that complicated because what's going on here is we have the sample sizes accounted for several times as we make our calculation. So you can see n sub 1, that's our first sample, times the variance for our first sample, plus n sub 2 minus 1 times the variance for our second subsample, all divided by our first sample size plus our second sample size, minus 2, you take the square root of all of that. That first chunk of our equation is then going to be multiplied by the square root of our first sample plus our second sample divided by our first sample times our second sample. Now what that means is, once we know just the sample sizes for each of our samples, relatively easy to do, just count them once you've broken it into the two groups, then the only thing that remains to solve this equation is the two variances for each of our subsamples. So, there's a, a set of steps that you should follow when testing a hypothesis with a t-test. First, you, of course, want to specify your research hypothesis. Which category of your independent variable do you think will have a higher mean than which other category of your independent variable? Then you're going to specify a null hypothesis. You're going to claim that there's no relationship between your independent variable and your dependent variable. You're going to collect and observe data. You're going to identify your samples. You're going to calculate the means and variances for each sample and use those to estimate both the standard error of the difference in sample means and the t-statistic. Then you're going to calculate degrees of freedom, because like chi-square, we're going to need degrees of freedom to use the t-statistic. We're going to look up the critical values of t, just like we did for chi-square. Then we're going to discuss what our results mean substantively relative to our hypothesis and of course we're going to go on and talk about how we might improve this based on you know for future research etc here's a sample problem a researcher back in 2004 is interested in how gender affects candidate evaluation examining george w bush the researcher contacts seven women and eight men and asks what things up to a maximum of five that they like or dislike about george w bush now they might like his foreign policy they might like his position on education, but might dislike his position on highways or dislike his overuse of a helicopter, etc., etc. They 
Take up to five of these things, and if someone likes five things and dislikes nothing, then they get a plus five. If someone dislikes five things and likes zero, then they would get a negative five. And so it goes. So if they like three things and dislike two, they would get a positive one, etc. So we get a scale that runs from negative five all the way to positive five. Your first task, of course, is set up your research hypothesis, which might read something like, men are more likely to rank George W. Bush higher on the like scale than are women, which you can see here is like saying that the mean for men is expected to be greater than the mean for women. And we also, of course, have to specify a null hypothesis, which is saying that there's no relationship between gender, our independent variable, and the number of likes and dislikes for George W. Bush. Or essentially, we're saying that the mean for men is not going to have a statistically significant difference for the, the, uh, from the mean for women. Good. Okay, so the third step, we're going to collect our data, and then we're going to identify our two subsamples. So we have our 15 observations that we've divided up into two subsamples, one for men and one for women. And with that, we're then going to calculate the means and the variances for each of our subsamples and recall the formulas for the means and the variances. Now, you can set this up just as you've done in your univariate statistics, where you just add up the, the, the value of the observations for males and divide by the total number of observations. So the males add up to 14 divided by 8. We get an average likes-dislikes for George W. Bush of 1.75. We do the same thing for females. We add up the value of x, which in this case is the average likes and dislikes. So, you know, our ninth observation, our first female on, a, on balance liked one thing about George W. Bush. Our second observation for females, or our tenth observation overall, disliked five things about George Bush, etc. We add them up, that comes to minus four, divide by our number of observations, seven, and that gives us an average likes dislikes for females of negative 0 0.57. So, on average, a typical female was slightly negative towards George W. Bush. And we can in fact see that the average male of 1.75 and the average female of negative 0.57, there is a difference there, and in fact it's the difference that we had predicted. Males do like more things on average than do women about George W. Bush back in 2004. We use our means, of course, to calculate our variances. Remember, the variance is just the sum of the all the observations of your uh, variable, whether males or females, the, the likes that they have, minus the average likes squared divided by n minus 1. And you just work your way through the calculation. So you do the x sub i minus x bar. So for example, for our first observation of males, we have uh, about for x, we've got negative 1. We subtract our mean of 1.75. That gives us negative 2.75 when we square it, 7.56, etc. We do that for every observation. And when we sum that column, we get our sum of squared errors for males, which we then divide by n minus 1. So we divide the 47.5 by n minus 1 n is 8, so divided by 7, gives us a variance for males of 6.79. And the same thing for females, you add up all the calculations, you get a sum of squared errors for females of 47.71, divide by the n minus 1, so you divide by 7 minus 1, 6, so 47.71 divided by 6 gives us a variance for females of 7.95. Perfect. All right, so now that we have our variances and our means, we can start working on number one, the standard error of the difference in means, the denominator in our t-test formula, and then number two, we're going to calculate t. So you just need to populate the values. Uh, what I've done now is I've subscripted, instead of sample one, I've put an m for our first subsample, males, and an f for our second subsample, of females. And so anywhere that there is an n sub m, I put the sample size for males, and you can see that, you know, in the first chunk there's eight minus one, uh, you know, uh, times the, the variance for males, 7 minus 1 for the females, times the variance for females of 7.95, all divided by 8, the sample size for men, plus 7, the sample size for women, minus 2. Do the same thing in the second chunk, 8 plus 7 over 8 times 7. We'll calculate all of these, solve them to everything underneath the square root. That'll get, give us 7.33. Take the square root of that times uh, square root of 0 0.27. When we multiply that through, we get a standard error of the difference in means of 1.41, which we can now bring over here, and that's going to be our denominator. And of course, in the numerator, we take our first mean and subtract our second mean, and so we have a 1.75 minus negative 0.57, all divided by 1.41. That gives us a t-statistic of 
In our eighth step, we just calculate the degrees of freedom, which in this case is the first sample size plus the second sample size minus two, eight plus seven minus two. We have 13 degrees of freedom here. All right, so now that we have our T statistic of 1.64 and 13 degrees of freedom, we would go to a T distribution table and look up its value. And remember, what we're looking for is the critical value of T that our calculated T exceeds, all right? And we need typically in the social sciences to be at least 90, 95, or 99% confident. Now you can see here what the, the top here says is that these are our probabilities of making a type 1 error, right? So this is the critical value of T along the top line. So there's 20%, 10%, 5%, 2%, 1%, 0.2%, uh, and 0.1% chance of making a type 1 error. And as you go down the columns, depending on your degrees of freedom, that's the critical value that you have to exceed to be at least, you know, 80%, 90%, 95%, etc. Confident that you're not going to make a type 1 error when you reject the null. Now our calculation was for 1.64 at 13 degrees of freedom. So we're really only interested in this one row here with 13 degrees of freedom. We need to see the highest critical value of T that we exceed. And so you can see our 1.64 exceeds the first one. That's the 1.35. and as you look at to, to the header of the column, that tells us, well, in fact, we're at least 80% confident that we can reject the null. But that's not our social science standard. Remember, we want to be 90% confident. So the next column over, we have 1.771. That's where we have 90% confident that we can reject the null and not make a type 1 error. And in fact, we have not exceeded that value. So in this case, there's no point in checking 95 and 99 because those numbers increment upwards from this point. So in this case, we haven't achieved that 90% confidence that we can reject the null. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fail to reject the null hypothesis in this particular case. Now what that means is that we're not at least 90% confident that our two subsample means are in fact different from one another. That the two subsamples sub reflecting the subpopulations, there's no difference in the subpopulations that we can claim given what we've observed. We don't know that males and females would, in fact, evaluate George W. Bush any differently. So what does this mean substantively? Well, first, we talk about statistical significance. And that, of course, is what our t-distribution table was telling us. And in this case, as I said, we failed to reject the null, as we did not surpass the minimum threshold of 90% confidence. Thus, we don't want to risk making a type 1 error and make a false positive claim. We can't observe that it, if, if we inser, observe the entire population that the amount of like or dislike for George W. Bush differs between men and women. However, our form or direction was as predicted. The sample that we predicted to have a higher mean, men, did in fact have a higher mean, right? However, we can't be certain of this because we failed to reject the null. And moreover, we can actually talk about in this case, the strength or degree of the relationship in real world terms. And by that, what I mean is we know how far the two averages are from one another. And we can say that when you subtract the mean for males of 1.75 and subtract the mean for females, negative 0.57, that's a 2.32 difference. Or men on average like 2.32 things about George W. Bush more than do women. Again, we couldn't, be we couldn't be confident in this because we failed to reject the null hypothesis. However, keep in mind, when you reject the null hypothesis, instead of risking making a type 1 error, now you're risking making a type 2 error. When you fail to reject the null hypothesis, and you should have rejected the, the null hypothesis if you'd observed the entire population, that's a type 2 error, meaning you've made a false negative claim. There is a relationship if you observe the population, but you've claimed that there isn't one. Now, what I've told you about type 2 errors is that typically in this class, if you have a small sample size and you have a strong suspicion that ha if you observed more sample, eventually that relationship will emerge. If there actually is a relationship in the population, if you collect enough sample, it'll emerge. Now, if you have a lot of sample, if we'd observed 1,500 observations and it was not statistically significant, I probably wouldn't go on to say something like we need to observe more sample. But because we only observed 15 observations, we have a very small sample size. So we might want to reserve judgment because, number one, 
we exceeded our 80% confidence threshold. And number two, we know we only have 15 observations. And number three, our hypothesized relationship was otherwise as predicted. So I might reserve judgment and I'd say, well, we, in this case, failed to reject the null hypothesis. We know we risk making a type 2 error if we make that claim. So future research might want to look at exactly the same thing, but increase sample size. All right, good. So I think we have a pretty good understanding of what a t-statistic is and then the t-test. We have a, a sense as to when to use the t-test and we have an understanding of how to calculate the t-test through our example problem. Terrific. The next lecture video that we look at is going to look at a similar sort of comparison means problem, but instead of looking at the t-statistic, we're going to look at ANOVA and the f-test.